Katy Perry's Dark Horse. Not something I'd usually talk about on this channel. The subject of a successful lawsuit by the rapper Flame, who alleges Katy stole his riff. Also, maybe the worst pop song in history. So why devote any time to it? Well, two of my favorite YouTubers came out in defense of Dark Horse, arguing it's not crossing any legal lines. Maybe so, but I think the situation is a little more nuanced than that. Why am I being so contrarian? Stay tuned. Let me fend off potential criticism by 8-miling myself. Yes, this video is a naked and craven play for your eyeballs. Yes, I'm hoping to exploit the hype around the Katy Perry lawsuit to score more views for this channel and ultimately more sales of my digital products. Finally, I'm 100% piggybacking on the efforts of two of my favorite YouTubers, Adam Neely and Rick Beato, in an artless attempt to siphon off some of their viewership to my own channel. Everybody still here? Great, let's talk about it. Here's the gist as I understand it. Remember that annoying song you'd always hear at the grocery store or waiting in line at CVS with that lyric about playing with magic and that jaw-droppingly stupid riff that made you think all the A-list writers were on vacation? In the ultimate irony, Whoever wrote that riff for Katy Perry wasn't even original enough to come up with the most annoying riff in history on his or her own. Because it turns out it's lifted almost verbatim from a rapper named Flame. And Flame sued Katy and got a musicologist from the University of Washington to testify at a jury trial and won that suit. Speaking of emulation, Adam, who's one of my favorite YouTubers and whose polemic storytelling style was one of the inspirations for the direction I took with this channel, does a great breakdown of why the decision is legally problematic. As I explained in the comment I left on Adam's channel, the purpose of this video is not to refute the legal basis of the argument, but rather to yes and it and provide, let's say, an alternative. First, Let's steel man Adam's argument. Steelhead. No, not steelhead, steel man. It means to make the best case for someone else's opinion. Kind of the opposite of straw manning. Steelhead. No. Anyway, Adam and Rick are saying that awarding damages to flame is legally problematic. You can copyright a melody. Say yes or no, no maybe, so just be sure. But not a minor scale. or a bass line. What's more, you can find countless melodies throughout the ages that used similar scalar runs to Flames. Flames producer himself was probably inspired by a track called Why I'm Hot, which had the same bass line, albeit in a different key, but a different melody. This is why I'm hot. Actually, it's worth mentioning a better melody. Since this is a drum lesson, let's talk briefly about how to play over that bass line. I promise this will become relevant later on. It turns out to be the perfect tempo for some classic Aaron Spears style Tom Fillery. Here I'll break down just one linear style groove you can do over that bass line. Hey guys, wanted to give you a little groove that you can play with tracks like Dark Horse slash Joyful Noise. Let me first play it with the track. Okay, so I think I got that consistent. Basically, it's two halves. The first half goes. Yeah. 
And the second half is a variation that sounds like this. Three, four. Here's why that bass line is important. Together with almost 100% similar scalar runs in the melody, the pairing of the bass line with the melody sets up a very similar vibe between the two tracks, even though originally they're in two different keys. So you can't copyright a bass line, right? Which seems crazy given that some bass lines are melodies themselves. Here's Red Clay by Freddie Hubbard. Here's Orbitando from David Sanchez. Here's In the Crease from Branford Marsalis. And here's Only Clave from Dap Theory. And the facts, man. One of my favorite things about modern jazz writing is the polyphony between bass line and melody. Okay though, you can't copyright a bass line. A bass line is never a melody. That's the letter of the law. So you can artlessly rip off a bass line. True, the bass lines are slightly different between Flames Tune and Katie's, but say they weren't. Say they were exactly the same. Katie's producer could just completely lift the bass line and not fear any copyright repercussions. Next, you can't copyright a scale, right? So any melody that's scalar within a minor scale is permissible. Well, good thing Flame just used a descending scalar run from the minor third to the tonic then. Because if he'd done otherwise, Katie's producer might have been in hot water. And this leaves aside the question of where do you draw that bright line between it's a scale and it's a melody. Are only stepwise diatonic runs within the scale protected? But if it's a bigger intervallic jump, all of a sudden it's copyright infringement? What about chromatics? If you cross between two diatonic scale degrees a whole step apart using a connecting tone, are you all of a sudden infringing on a copyright? Leaving aside that question, here's Freddie Hubbard's Red Clay. And here's a completely original tune I wrote called Blue Steel. Oh, and rhythm isn't copyrighted either, so I hope you don't mind that I just took Freddie's original rhythm. This song is now for sale on my personal band camp for $99. What I'm getting at is that at some point, doesn't it become a spirit of the problem violation? You color within the lines to take multiple actions, which on their own are legal, but which in aggregate create something that's murkier, as the YouTuber Westknife shows us in this incisive example. Yeah. Which leads me to propose a different standard than the legal one. But first, a cool tom fill to play over the bass line from Dark Horse, which I need to emphasize I have free reign to use because bass lines can't be copyrighted. Okay, now I want to show you a quick tom fill that you can do in sort of the Aaron Spears style based off of this groove that we were doing before. Check it out. I'm going to play it with the track first.
So there are two variations to this, but this is essentially what I'm doing. Three, four. And the other variation is that I'll throw in a kick note on the last snare rim shot. So I'll show you. Three, four. Anyway, I want to propose a different standard than the legal one. The cut the shit standard. As I wrote in my comment to Adam, the cut the shit standard asks one very simple question. Did they arrive at it independently? I don't mean, were they impervious to all musical influence? It's more like, did they know their song was ultra similar to the other one? And did they put it out and commercialize it anyway? Did they even intentionally alter the most minimal of details to ensure that they'd be clear of a copyright strike? all in service of using someone else's tune. As a pretty crappy composer, I've written tunes, or more apropos of the Katy Perry flame thing, bassline harmony or bassline melody combinations that I later realized were somebody else's tune. Sure, as long as I didn't rip off the melody, I might be legally protected. But what would happen to me if the author of that tune heard me perform it? The several times I've made that realization, I've either called the person and asked their permission, or changed the tune. When I saw Dave Douglas at the Vanguard in 2003, he told a story about a tune called The Frizzell Dream. As Dave told it, he was having a dream about playing a gig with Bill, playing Bill's original music, and woke up with one of the tunes from that gig still in his head. Dave eventually wrote it down and recorded it, with Bill but not before calling Bill to make sure that he hadn't written anything similar. By the cut the shit standard, if the composer of the later tune realizes there's enough similarity to an earlier tune that it would cause an untoward appearance and then they still put that tune out and commercialize it, it's time to cut the shit. This isn't red clay, by the way, it's green putty. Again, for better or worse, this has little to not to do with the legal standard governing what's protected material and what's not. Let alone the arbitrary enforcement, i.e. Katie can make millions off of a melody which may or may not be somebody else's. But if I tried to use five seconds of either tune in this video, even though it's clearly a case of fair use, I'd be zinged with a copyright strike and demonetized right away. In fact, if you're seeing ads at the bottom of this video, that's why. So I agree with Adam and Rick that you have to be careful to separate the legal definitions from the gut feeling ones. But there's another reason I have such venom for Kate. It's not even a good song. You could have written literally anything else over that bass line and not only saved yourself a lawsuit, but ended up with a better riff. Please direct any comments or complaints about this lesson to the email address on the screen. In all seriousness, hope you dig the lesson. If you're not subscribed and you dug it, please give me a sub. And if you're not subscribed to either Adam or Rick's excellent channels, please subscribe to them as well. I've linked them below. See you next time. Boom, 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 boom,